Okay, it looks like we've got a good number of people. Thanks for joining the webinar today. It's titled Understanding and Eliminating Fugitive Emissions in Valves. Uh, you can go to the next slide. So a little bit of housekeeping to start things off. Uh, we want to make this as interactive as possible. So if you have a question, please, by all means, submit it through the Q&A box there. You can also use the chat functionality if you've got some technical problems to communicate with me directly. And um, I should have introduced myself. I'm Sam Wind. I work on the marketing team here at CGIS. Uh, next slide. So about CGIS. Uh, CGS is a global supplier of the highest performance valves, controls, and automation. Uh, we have a primary focus on severe service valves, and I really believe that that stems directly from our chairman, Ross Waters. He's uh, actively working with the MSS Society on creating a new standard practice right now. Uh, the standard practice not only defines what a severe service valve is, but also what applications they should be used in. Um, We've grown quite a bit over the past 40 years. We started out in Vancouver and now we're actually represented in 13 different locations across Canada, Australia, and New Zealand. And uh, we actually just opened uh, our latest office is in the greater Toronto area in Brampton, Ontario. Next slide. So uh, a little bit about Cheota. Uh, they're a privately held company from 1984 to today. They are focused on infrastructure and technical development, and they have a fully integrated manufacturing process. A uh, quick introduction of the two speakers today. We've got Kevin Niebergal. He is a senior technical representative from CGIS. He's got about 25 years of experience supporting clients uh, with technical valve solutions, and he also is a severe service application expert. Uh, Kevin's joined by Doug Jones, who's based out of Houston, Texas, uh, with Chowda. So Doug acts as the Senior VP of Sales and Marketing there. Um, he has 38 years of experience in the valve industry, and he also has a focus on severe service valves. And right now, he actually serves on various API task forces, including API 641 for fugitive emissions. And with that, I'm going to pass it over to you guys. Take it away. Great, thank you very much, Sam. Uh, it's great to be here and thanks to everybody for, for joining us for this, this webinar on uh, reviewing the terms and uh, approach to fugitive emissions. Uh, I hope you all uh, gain some valuable information from this. Uh, as the agenda states, uh, you know, we are gonna have a very brief, quick overview of, of valve and valve categories specifically. Uh, Doug is going to, uh, uh, work through fugitive emissions and, and what are the common terms, the industry standards, uh, valve design standards, common leak paths, uh, things that uh, may not be at uh, top of mind when we're thinking about selecting valves. Uh, but before we get started, I wanted to uh, take a moment uh, to, uh, to extend my thanks to everybody that's present, but also um, to, as a competitive, athlete in hockey, soccer, and distance running in my, my years gone by. Uh, one of the things that I always relied on is having uh, valuable resources to uh, help me select the right products. So I'm thankful for having the opportunity to work with people such as Doug Jones and uh, Richard Harmon from Chioda, along with our extended CGIS team that is, is focused on knowledge-based information uh, that is objective. Uh, that can help us make uh, powerfully intelligent decisions and, and create solutions uh, for our, our processes or our day-to-day our -day business. Also, I wanted to take a moment, uh, a, uh, a safety moment, and, and uh, talk about the, the wet blanket of, of COVID that is a, a, across the globe, uh, affecting us all. Uh, but one of the things that I'm seeing when I'm out in public spaces where in British Columbia we now must uh, wear masks is the improper use of the masks. Uh, I see a lot of people like this, they're not covering their nose or they're sitting below their chin. Uh, really what we need to be doing is covering our nose and our, our mouth so that we can uh, eliminate or prevent as best possible uh, the transmission of the, the droplets as we uh, speak or as we uh, just simply breathe. Uh, so 
these behaviors are going to help us. It may not uh, eliminate, but it's definitely going to uh, bend the curve down to uh, a point where we can get back to uh, a new normal in the, the near future, I hope. Uh, so on that, um, three categories of general purpose valves. Uh, general purpose, uh, we have fit for purpose valves, general purpose valves, severe service valves. These are separated by different factors uh, that we'll cover later in the presentation. Uh, but the, the largest installed base of valves is really within our general purpose valves. And when we think about some of our uh, facilities, plants, uh, process industry applications, uh, general purpose valves and valves in general have a significant um, uh, components that require sealing. And this can, uh, you know, lead into the, the conversation of fugitive emissions. Next slide. So in the world of valves, uh, through Doug's work and through Ross's work, who's our chairman at CJS, uh, they've been working together on the MSS uh, task force to develop a, uh, a severe service uh, valve standard. Uh, it will be released as a critical valve uh, standard because severe service valves are not always the right valve. Uh, it depends on the application. That's the most important thing that we need to be thinking about. And we can make really solid, powerful, intelligent decisions when we know what the application is. Uh, so when we look at applications, we obviously, on the left, we have high cycles. Uh, the next is pressure. Then we have solids, then we have uh, temperature, and then we have the corrosion, and then we have cost. You know, what is the cost to acquire the valve? What's the impact cost if we don't have the right valve? There's a number of different factors that we need to be thinking about when we're making valve decisions or valve choices. And uh, obviously it needs to be feasible within the framework that we have for our, our projects or our, uh, you know, our operations and maintenance. Uh, but there's more to uh, selecting a valve than just going by its type or its materials. Uh, so I will, from here, I'll pass it over to Doug uh, to uh, launch into the, the meat of this presentation. Thanks, Kevin. Uh, so uh, kind of reiterate what Sam said, my name is Doug Jones. I'm the Senior Vice President of Sales and Marketing for Chowda USA. Um, I said 38 years in the valve business, it's almost like they had to uh, uh, lift me out of a box out of the ground or something to do this. But, uh, but it has, uh, it has uh, it's been sort of an interesting ride over the last several years. So I think before we start, I want to, I want to thank Sam and, and Kevin for what they've done. I also want to introduce and, and acknowledge uh, Richard Harmon, who is our director of marketing here at, at Shouter USA. And, and has been largely responsible for assembling uh, many of these slides, right? A lot of the research on the fugitive missions and compiling all of this into what, what we hope to be is, is the easiest to understand, most understandable process. So this is a, this is, this is a, a uh, it's a relevant topic area. Uh, it, it's also can sometimes be laborious to work through all of these standards and what they all mean. Uh, it's, it's what we hope to do today is to really talk about where they're applicable, uh, which standards apply to what type of valves, if they even apply to valves at all, right? And, and kind of give you some guidelines for maybe how you should incorporate these standards into your day-to-day -day practices and realizing that there are different, uh, there are different disciplines on this, on this call, right? So there are, there are people that sell these things. Uh, there are people that design plants um, EP, from an EPC contractor standpoint, uh, and then there are people that are that are running the plants that need to understand uh, the sources of their of their FE problems and what they can do to to fix them. So that's what we're going to try to accomplish. Um, it's it's a it's a rather as I said it's a rather uh, text heavy and a lot of a lot of information. Uh, you'll all get copies of the presentation afterwards with with the with some additional notes at the bottom that that kind of help further explain things that 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 frankly I can't go into just in the interest of time during this presentation. So 
uh, with that, we'll kind of we'll kind of kick it off, right? So what we're going to cover are some of the common terms that you hear. Um, <clears throat> what are the current standards that you run across from day to day or should be aware of? Uh, kind of where did they come from? And how do these different standards apply to valves or packing that you uh, that you use on a on a, on a common basis? Um, common terms that we will that we will discuss are what are fugitive emissions uh, and and for valves the term fugitive emissions typically refer to a measurable leakage uh, through methods that we'll discuss a little bit later uh, that come out of the stem seal area and it, it can also refer to body joints and 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 other connections like flange connections but th but the reality is, is that the most dynamic seal uh, as it relates to a valve is the stem seal area because of the operation of the stem, et cetera. So that, that is the most likely uh, place for fugitive emissions to occur. And consequently, it's the most targeted area for these standards. So this is just kind of a picture to, to uh, simulate that, right? So. Uh, fugitive emissions is basically leakage to atmosphere that's detectable by sensing devices, not necessarily by our human noses, right? So there, there's some there's some slides later that will kind of talk about perspective on what qualifies as a fugitive emissions versus what we can actually detect uh, with our with our noses, right? And it's a, it's significant. Uh, other common terms: so VOCs, volatile organic compounds. So, so in our world um, that, that we typically play in, in the valve industry and, and then also uh, just in the Canadian and the US market, this is typically commonly, um, commonly referred to as far as hydrocarbons go, right? So, um, so uh, methane is an example of a hydrocarbon that would be considered a VOC. Um, hazardous air, Pollutants, haps, or basically those that create events, right? When you when you have a pollutant that gets into the atmosphere at such a level that it that it poses some damage or some danger to the public, uh, that's what's termed a, a, a hap, right? So an EPA in our world is is the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, right? So that is uh, that's the governing body, at least down here in the states, and I think an influencing agency as it relates to many, uh, many uh, standards that have been written or many regulations that have been written in Canada and other places. Uh, type testing is, is basically what we refer to as, as the, when we talk about these standards, you always qualify, there's a qualification test where you will test certain samples or certain sizes and certain classes of valves uh, and even certain types of valves those are considered type tests, right? So the so the valves that you that you submit to these tests will qualify within certain parameters up and down uh, should you pass that test. So I I think this is it's an important point to know that that type testing is is kind of a one-off testing, right? So this is not a this is not a production test. Type testing is is done on a one-off basis as opposed to a production test, which would be a test done. <clears throat> as the valves are produced on a on a grander scale, right? <clears throat> so low E, this is this is the term that gets thrown around a lot, right? So uh, we we see a lot of specifications that that talk about we need a low E valve. Okay, so you'll you'll see from some of these standards and some of the evolution of some of these standards. That's a that's a little bit of a uh, that's a little bit of a hard target to hit, right? So, depending on what standard and what revision, what edition of the standard that you're referring to, that can mean anything from 10,000 parts per million down to 50 parts per million. So, it's you can't really use the term low E without tying it to a definition of what your emission standard is, right? So, different meanings for different for different people. So. It's really, it's really only one half of the requirement. The next half of the requirement is what's your definition of a low E? Um, so most of the 
most of the consent in, in the U.S. and I'm sure it's the same in Canada. So, so part of the permitting process that that refineries, chemical plants have to go through is is they need to uh, they need to agree to consent decrees by the EPA that that basically is a prerequisite to permitting. And most of these like, consent decrees will include some sort of standard for uh, for packing uh, and and generally may include a, a warranty issue that that is that is attempted to pass down to manufacturers of either valves or are packing right to basically warrant against emissions above a certain level for a period of up to five years in most cases that's the that's what comes up and so it may be just a flat out warranty for five years or it may be a warranty that says it's it's you guarantee it not to leak that through the packing area uh, in excess of so many parts per million over this five year period, given the assumption of uh, of adequate uh, prescribed preventive maintenance programs, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so it's it's a Consent decrees are becoming a term a term that that we as manufacturers have to deal with more and more frequently. Parts per million. So this is the measurement that all these standards refer to. Okay, particularly the standards that test using a hydrocarbon-based medium, right, like methane. Okay, so all of the API standards, everything speaks to parts per million. So. Uh, I don't need to define parts per million. Everybody can do that, right? But I think the the, the reference here is the um, is the is to, to do a comparison here between atmospheric concentrations uh, versus a versus a natural gas odorizer, which I, which speaks to my point a little bit earlier. Is you may not be able to take, detect some of these things by your nose, but that doesn't mean it's not an FE problem, right? Uh, and then, so most of the FE standards are 100 ppm or thereabouts, right? So methane isn't flammable in the air till 50,000 parts per million. You can't smell uh, natural gas uh, given the odorizers that, are, odorizers that are prescribed to inject into natural gas. You can't smell natural gas until it reaches 10,000 ppm, okay? And then, uh, and then uh, methane, for example, in the atmosphere, the normal atmospheric methane, if you're around cows or something, it may be a little bit higher than that, but normally it's at two, two parts per million. So the, the range is pretty striking, and I think it gives some perspective as to what you're actually measuring uh, when, you're, when you're adhering to these standards. And, it, and the, the upshot of it is if you buy, if you buy valves, that adhere to these standards, you, you're getting a pretty low leakage rate, right? So a pretty low FE. Uh, the picture over there just kind of depicts a typical sniffing device that might be used to uh, during a valve test. In this this particular case, probably a 624 test. So that's the uh, that's the uh, typical sniffing method. So method 21 is the is the standard that was originated i guess by the environmental protection agency uh, decades ago frankly <clears throat> to uh, to really ensure that plants were compliant with their eldar regulation which is leak detection and repair um, they were finding that without a standard there was no real way to govern the eldar requirements so uh, EPA came up with with this method of of testing uh, and determining uh, what the what the actual fugitive emissions and leakage standards were, and that really has become the the measuring stick or the guideline for the consent decrees and and consequently all of the associated standards that were written uh, as a result. So. I think I mentioned before, but the most common uh, the most common point of fugitive emissions is between the is in the sim seal area, right? Between the sim and the uh, and the pack. Um, and so, typically, when they sniff, they're going to they're going to probe 
at the point where the stem exits the packing, right? So it's going to be right up here in the in the gland flange area, and that's where the the probe is going to be inserted to uh, to do the best job of trying to sniff the uh, the FE. So where do they come from? So this is kind of a convoluted but very interconnected group here. So uh, so typically there is there is some sort of group similar to, to EPA, whether it's IPCC or the Kyoto Accord or TA Luft, who will come up with regulations on this is your measurement guideline, this is what we're able to accept, this this is the prerequisite for being able to build this plant, right? So, so from that, uh, standardized bodies like API, ISO, uh, MSS will come up with testing methods to certify various pieces of equipment, right? Whether it's valves, whether it's packings, whether it's pumps, right? So they'll, they will come up with standards in order to certify, to type test, remember the word type test, right? To, to do type testing to certify their equipment uh, in order to meet those standards. So the end users will adopt protocols, emission protocols, based on what the regulations want them to do, require them to do, and then also within what the reality of API, ISO, MSS, the various industry standardized bodies have, have come up with testing methods to do, right? Uh, and then manufacturers, you know, we're just the whipping boys, right? We we just do whatever we have to do to try to meet those standardized uh, those standards, and so that we can uh, so that we can be accepted by the end users, and so everybody makes the national regulators happy at the end of the day. That's how it all works. So there are various studies right and this will tie a couple of points in there's various studies that that say the the source of fugitive emissions in a typical refinery or chemical plant 60 percent of those fugitive emissions originate from valves right so that that seems harsh and but i want to put it in a little perspective i think the, the, the reason is not because valves are all bad. I think the, the primary reason for that is the fact that there are so many valves in a plant, right? So this is a volume driven statistic more than it is necessarily a performance statistic. Uh, you know, I could, I could sit here and make the argument that a pump shaft is, is, a, is a greater source of fugitive emissions than a valve stem, but the reality is there's there's exponentially higher number of valves in a plant than there are pump shafts, right? So uh, so I think I think it's a volume issue as to why it it uh, it it makes such a such a high content of of uh, fugitive emission sources. But but the reality is, however it got there, it needs to be addressed, right? So it is it is a point. It's a topic. Uh, it's the reason we're having this webinar. It's the reason why we have this discussion almost daily with with customers about what is how do we address, how do we minimize our fugitive emissions, how do we specify, how do we buy properly, and and what do we do with these things once we have them, right? To 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 keep us from having a problem. Okay, and then the other the other uh, the other uh, diagram points to what I said a little bit a little bit earlier. So 80% of the FE uh, of the FE concentrations that come from valves come from the stem seal area. And again, that's a logical thing given the way valves operate and the and the dynamic action of the stem through the packing as opposed to the static action of a body seal or a, or a pipe plan seal. So we're going to talk about primarily four different standards, and these are probably the four most common standards as it relates to fugitive emissions, uh, particularly pertinent to valves, right? So there's six, API 622, which is, which is type testing for process valve packing for fugitive emissions. So here's the good place to start, right? So 622, I've seen too many times, gets thrown into a valve specification 
when the reality is 622 has nothing to do with valves other than the fact that a valve has packing in it, right? So 622, first and foremost, is a test that was developed by API to test valve packings. And I'll get into a little bit of, of what it entails in a minute. 624 kind of followed 622 in that, okay, great, we've got packings that, that, are, that are good, but packings don't do us any good unless they're contained within a valve, right? So that means we need to type test the valve that contains the packing. Perfectly sensical, which is, you know, what API tries to do. So API then developed a, a test for rising stem valves because, again, back to the volume formula, if you go into a typical refinery, there's a there's a about a hundred gate valves to every to every ball valve, right? So so rising stem valves, particularly in the in the general purpose area that Kevin spoke to a little bit earlier, rising stem valves make up the majority of the uh, of the legacy valve installations in plants, right? Is is that the trend going forward? Who knows, right? But but what what you guys what users have to deal with. And what we have to deal with with manufacture as manufacturers is, you know, let's let's address the high volume issues so that we can so that we can bring the overall levels of FE down. Okay, so 624 was developed to type test rising stem valves. That includes gate valves, glow valves, knife gates, things like that. Right. So then, following 624, 641 was developed. A uh, little bit tougher test, right? A little bit tougher to develop because there are many types of quarter turn valves, right? One size does not fit all. Uh, a gate valve, uh, a gate valve is is really pretty limited as far as the the number of different designs there are, particularly as it relates to how they are sealed at the stem, right? So a little bit easier to write that standard. 624 was pretty pretty restrictive as well in that it in that it was written around graph graphitic based packings only right so 641 had to be a little bit different there were different types a lot of different stem type of stem seals on quarter turn valves because that's going to include ball valves plug valves butterfly valves uh and etc and so there's and, and 641 unlike 624 includes other packing styles, right? So it can be a graphitic based, it can be PTFE based, it can be an O-ring, or it can be uh, it can be a lip seal in the case of a sleeve plug valve, for example. So, so various types of stem seals, which means one test can't fit all. So the 641 we'll talk about a little bit a little bit later has different types of type testing depending on what your stem seal looks like. And so uh, ISO 15848-1 uh, is the European standard, which is, I don't know, lack of a better word, a little bit of a catch-all standard, right? So it is a, um, it's a, it's a standard where there's a lot of flexibility as to how you want to test your valve and how you want to classify your uh, your fugitive emissions. There are there are service duty issues. There are there are test medium issues. There are cycle uh, cycle number of cycle issues. Right. So whereas all the API tests are revolved around methane as the test medium because it's hydrocarbon based test, uh, ISO uh, also has some uh, helium option in addition to the uh, the methane. Okay, so 622 was first published in, in 2006, uh, second edition in 11, and then the third edition, which is the current in 2018. Over that time, the, the acceptance standard dropped from 500 parts per million down to 100 parts per million. Uh, again, this is a packing test only. It involves basically a test fixture uh with uh that that does cycles that, that looks like a gate valve stem right but that's but it is a fixture it's designed to use um uh eighth inch to quarter inch cross-section packing uh whatever whatever that set may look like okay and like all of these api tests so it is it is a 
it's, it, it entails both a, a, a fixed number of mechanical cycles together with a fixed number of thermal cycles, okay? So to be specific in this one, it's 1,510 mechanical cycles and five thermal cycles, a mechanical cycle being, uh, being defined as open, closed, open, right? Or vice versa, um, okay? The, the key thing is, again, not to beat a dead horse, but 622 is for packing only. Okay, so 624 is, is for the rising stem valves, gate valves, knife gates, globes, that sort of thing. Uh, this was first published in 2014 uh, and has not been updated, although it is in revision now. Isn't that correct, Richard? Because the, the standard only lasts five years and that's gotta be, it's gotta be republished. So it was written as 100 parts per million. It 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 main it remains as 100 parts per million, right? So uh, this, just like 622, involves cycle mechanical cycle testing as well as thermal cycle testing. Um, the um, the standard is uh, the standard is restricted to 24 inch uh, and below smaller sizes. Uh, and classes 1,500 smaller. So anything larger than that, and this is another thing that, that you need to be aware of as a specifier, as it's currently written, it only qualifies valves through 24 inch, right? So if you've got a 30 inch gate valve or a 36 inch gate valve, and you want it to be 624, you're not gonna be able to get that, right? So the, the next best option is to is to ask for a 36 inch gate valve with a 622 certified packing right as it's currently written 624 if you're required to have a 622 certified packing in in the valve that is that you supply to 624 right um and even more specifically you are required to have the brand of 622 packing that you type tested your gate valve with 2624. Okay. So not to not to sell any packing brands, but for example, if we if we passed our 624 test with a Chesterton packing in it, then all of our all of our valves that we sell certified to 624 need to have a six need to have Chesterton packing in it. Okay. Uh, Again, just to reiterate, so methane is the test medium. So the mechanical cycles is 310, three thermal cycles, right? And, and the reason for the fewer mechanical cycles is because gate valves A typically don't get cycled that frequently in a plant. Uh, if, if you have more cycle frequency than that, you need to consider another valve type. Uh, and then uh, the pressure is at 600 PSI uh, or whatever the max rated for the for the pressure class that you are testing, uh, and then uh, and then the the temperature of 500 degrees. Uh, so the thermal cycle, uh, you can see kind of the curve there. And again, you'll you'll get these slides as a as a note. But but every every 50 cycles, it will go through uh, some sort of thermal deal. The valves that this applies to, API 600, 602 valves, 603 valves, um, and 624, actually that's 623 for the globe valves. Um, but uh, I, think, I think it should be noted that in, that in API 600, uh, the new revision of 600 makes 624 a requirement, right? Before you can, before you can classify your gate valve as an API 600 valve, uh, you, you have to ensure that you are supplying a 624 certified valve, right? So, so now API is beginning to tie these standards together, right? So they're now, they're now beginning to, to tie the valve standard to the FE standard, just to try to help the user community out by certifying that, hey, look, if you buy an API 600 valve, it needs to be 624 compliant, okay? 641, so this is this is the quarter turn test. It was first published in 2016. I had the 
I'll just call it a pleasure, of serving on the initial task force that wrote this, uh, that wrote this standard. It took a long time because this does cover such a wide range of valves, right? So uh, long story short with this one, it is, uh, it, it's, it's again, it's 24 inch and, and smaller, class 1500 and, uh, and lower. The, the, the real complication gets into, uh, into the different test pressures and different tests and test temperatures, right? Because you can't test with methane necessarily at the same, your thermal cycle can't be as high with a Teflon based packing as it can with methane, right? And then, and then certain valves can only be tested at certain pressures because they're just not rated at higher pressures than that, right? So we had to come up with three different classifications of tests, um, depending on what valve you're submitting as your type test. So it's a little bit more complicated to get through. Also the qualification uh, parameters where 624, if you test a certain size and class, it, 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 it qualifies you up a certain amount and it qualifies you down a certain amount. With quarter turn valves, because there are such a wide range, the qualification parameters are different, right? So they're built more around what the stem diameter is, uh, what the what the packing diameter is, uh, and and the packing style, right? So you're you're really testing more of stem diameter and packing type and packing size and sealing arrangement to qualify you up and down. Uh, as opposed to as opposed to the valve size, the valve size is not is not as important in this particular case as it relates to qualification parameters, as is the stem size and the method of sealing the stem itself. Right? It's it's, it's way more detailed than we can cover in this, but we'll but we'll have some additional notes that uh, that will come along with these things that will kind of help you understand. Again, the maximum allowable leakage at this time with, this, with the current revision is 100 parts per million. The valves that are, uh, the valve categories that are, that are covered uh, where, where this standard is pertinent to uh, are API 599 for plugs, 608 for ball valves, uh, and 609 for butterfly valves. Okay. There is a 6D element in here, okay? Uh, I, I can tell you that when we wrote this standard, uh, there was uh, there were there were several manufacturers from the 6D world that wanted us to address 6D stem sealing systems in this standard. However, in the political landscape of of API, there's a there's a downstream refinery group, and then there's a midstream group. So this was hard enough to write for the to satisfy the refinery and the downstream group. We chased the 6D group back to the little midstream group, said, write your own. So that's that's kind of where that is. But but certainly given the same parameters that I spoke of earlier as far as pressures and temperatures go, you could certainly test a 6D valve with an O-ring seal uh, to to the uh, to the 641 standard, primarily because there's no stem adjustments allowed in this test anyway, right? So, uh, or I think there's one allowed with the current version, but that'll that'll go away at some point. So, um, so yeah, so that's that's kind of what these pertain to. So, 15848 is kind of a box of chocolates. Um, it's uh, it has it has lots of options. Uh, you are depending on how you want to classify your valves, um, you you can you can you can classify with with various tightness classes uh, with either helium or methane, depending on how you want to do it. Obviously, the helium has no thermal cycle uh, element to it. Uh, the the leak rate is is different, right? Because helium is not measurable in parts per million. Uh, the methane is is more akin to uh, to the API standards, um, and then the endurance classes basically allow you to select the number of mechanical cycles you want to test to. Okay? 
uh, control valves are a different world altogether. Uh, these are the, the, most of the things that I'm talking about here are strictly isolation valve oriented, right? Control valves are, while 15848 addresses it, it's not something that the API standards address. So again, with the box of chocolates, and I call this kind of the buffet of fugitive emission standards, right? So you just, you pick the ones you want your valve to qualify to, or you pick the ones your valve can qualify to, and then you, you mark it as such, right? So uh, these are the various marking options that you can, you can do with 15848. So 15848 type one or part one is a type test standard, much like the API tests are. Part two is more of a production standard where, uh, where the mechanical cycles is, are significantly reduced. Uh, it's all in helium. There's no thermal cycling. Uh, it's, it's, it's really a way I guess, for users to ensure that valves that have qualified to 15848 part one uh, also qualify as during the, excuse me, during the production phase also can qualify to part two. So if you haven't passed 15848-1, then you are not, uh, you are not eligible to go through the part two test. So. And then a little table, just kind of, uh, just kind of reiterating our, you know, in a tabular form, uh, a lot of the information that we just went through for these. So this is this is more of a reference guide than than anything else, right? So, uh, and I think the the bottom the bottom row kind of speaks to uh, a little bit of what I said before. So. So SSA is stem seal adjustments, right? So these are the allowable number of stem seal adjustments uh, during the test itself, right? So 622, 624 allow none. 641, I think allows one, uh, that won't last long. And then 15, 848, uh, you're allowed one to three uh, adjustments during the, during the test. So the trends, what's going to happen? Because these things, uh, I mentioned something to, you know, to, to Richard in the beginning that, that, you know, every, what is the term of an API standard? Richard, is it four years or five years? Five years. Five years, right? So every five years, API has to address uh, coming up with new additions or new revisions of, of, uh, of these standards, right? So uh, it's not always done in a timely manner, but but there is an effort done to, to try to adhere to that. So, uh, so 622 has a has kind of a, a prevailing question, and that is that according to the standard, the val the packings have to be suitable to 538C, right? That's pretty hot. Uh, the the reality is is though most of the the valve manufacturer or the packing manufacturers will only certify or only warrant their packings to 425C. Uh, and, and there's a couple of reasons for that, right? So most the, the, the most prevailing reason is that above that level, then, you know, you begin to get into environments where oxidizing happens. Oxidizing uh, creates uh, volume loss in the packing. And when you have volume loss in the packing, then, then unless you have some sort of method for automatic adjustment of that packing, or you have a really good preventive maintenance program that keeps it adjusted, then, then you're going to have a leak at some point. When you begin to lose volume because of oxidation of your graphitic packing, remember now, 622 is graphitic packing. So when you begin to have oxidation, you're gonna, you're gonna experience volume loss in there. So somehow in the next revision of 622, uh, API, the user community, and the manufacturing community have to come to some sort of uh, some sort of common ground on this temperature limitation. Okay, uh, 620, 624. The, the the prevailing trends are to move to a larger gate valve, uh, 30 inch. They're going to move up to 30 inch now, which will qualify a size up from that, right? So that'll that'll qualify a 36 inch valve. 
Uh, and then, and then I mentioned before the uh, the packing specific requirements. So they will do away with that now uh, in future future revisions, so that you don't have to use the same 622 certified packing that you type tested your valve to. You just have to use a 622 certified packing, right? So. In, in our case, it doesn't need to be Chesterton. It can be Garlock, it can be Klingar, it can be Joe the Ragman. It doesn't matter as long as who the, as long as the packing that we use has been certified to 622, okay? 624 will be, uh, uh, will also address larger diameter ball valves. We'll, they'll attempt to address some trunnion ball valve situations and then they're going to change the requirement for the, uh, the testing. Currently, the testing orientation of the valve has to be in a stem in a vertical position. So uh, we're going to start uh, requiring or allowing valves to be tested with the stem in a horizontal position. Uh, this, is, this is for ease of access as well as, in some cases, that, that's a more difficult test, right? Because you, you begin to get you begin to experience the, the, particularly when you have an operator on the stem, it's in the horizontal position, then you have, you have some potential for side loading of the stem. All of the, all of these things contribute to potential uh, stem leaks. So at this point, I'm gonna turn this, so we're gonna have a kind of a poll question. So Richard, I think you're gonna, you're gonna talk a little bit to this, okay? Yeah, so the idea, um, I think, behind this is we just wanted to kind of get get some feedback from the audience as far as what people are seeing um, required uh, in their specific areas, whether they're selling the valve into it or, um, you know, what they're seeing required from the, from the government. Um, there's a few standards and frameworks out there. Um, that I that I was able to kind of read up on and get some information about. So just kind of going through these really quick. Um, you've got PN 1338, which is more a, kind of a very high level framework document that's intended to sort of establish the intent of uh, you know reducing uh, reducing fugitive emissions, specifically in a petroleum refining environment, right? Um, so it doesn't provide a whole lot of technical detail in that document, but sort of gives just a general overview of the intent of, um, of these petroleum refineries to reduce emissions and do it in a certain way. Um, another document uh, that, that I see referenced is the CCME EPC 73E, which is a little bit more of a technical document. It gets into the weeds a little bit more uh, regarding how to measure and control uh, VOC emissions uh, from equipment. So equipment, when they say equipment, they mean rotating equipment, pumps, valves, also, um, also piping, so bolted joints. Uh, that provides a little, like I said, a little bit more specific technical information. It does reference uh, EPA method 21 as the measurement method that they use uh, for, for this standard, and they do provide a definition of a leak. So the de per this, uh, this document 73E, they define a leak as greater than 10,000 parts per million. So sort of going back to what Doug talked about um, earlier in the presentation, you know, a, a leak is a very subjective thing unless you put a specific number on it. Um, and in this case, the document does. And then there's also um, some, some provincial uh, regulations, regulatory requirements that I was able to find and uh, didn't really, I read them and didn't really, wasn't able to make too much of heads or tails of them other than to say that um, from, from the wording that they used and sort of the, the requirements they put forward, they seemed much more oriented towards um, upstream and midstream operations. So well sites, gas gathering, and, and stuff like that seemed like that would be more falling under these provincial regulations. Um, so anyway, I just wanted to put those forward. It looks like uh, as far as the poll results, um, 
so so far we've got 20 respondents and in about half of them just a little under half of them have seen the AER directive 017 um, and then seven seven people have seen the the standard 73e um, five have seen the 1338 standard and then just uh, one person has seen this PNG 017 which I think um, I think that essentially the PNG 017 and the AER directive are essentially the same thing, just <coughs> in different provinces. Um, so anyway, uh, interested to see if anybody's got uh, any insights on that um, that they that they want to share. You know, please feel free to do so in the chat. Good. Thanks, Richard. That's that's interesting. Yeah. So as far as kind of relating this back to what we talked about, just to wrap it up, um, you know, it looks like the the uh, the seventy three e document is pretty pretty commonly seen out there, um, which is not surprising to me. But but uh, given uh, given its relationship to EPA method twenty one, which is sort of the the mother, um, you know, test method that was defined by the EPA, you know, way back in the day, that you can start to see a connection, right, between that standard uh, and, and those types of measurements. So EPA method 21 is all about, number one, it's a methane test, right? So you want to um, be sure that you're relating your fugitive emissions leakage in terms of methane as the test medium. And number two, they give you a, a leak definition that's, you know, pretty generous when compared to um, most of the prevailing type test standards that Doug was talking about, right? So 624 and, and API 641 are both 100 ppm max tests. Uh, so I would say that, you know, when you look at that and compare it to your, your fugitive emission control standard, you, you know, 100 ppm pretty well gets you under that 10,000 ppm mark. Um, so. That's all I got. That's good. Thank you. I lost control here. So, so now that we have, um, so now that we've defined the terms, right? We've gone through a brief overview of what those terms are, what they apply to, and and what the what the test criteria. Uh, are for in order to qualify for those things. So, so now what do you do, right? So, uh, valve selection is the key. So, the so the, the emphasis of this next section is really talk about. You know, now that now that you know the terms, how do you make sure that you that you don't encounter a problem in your plant, right? So, the the first thing is is choose the right valve, right? So. Uh, don't try to make, don't put a valve in, a, in an application that's destined to fail, right? Uh, and, and also review the application, uh, review, you know, review the, the design of the valve, pick a good partner to, to discuss this with, uh, and, and if the application requires it, uh, it, add enhanced features to the, to the valve. There are, there are other technologies that can be applied to the valve design or to the valve packing area that, that kind of help enhance the stem seal beyond the testing methods that we've described, right? So, you know, you, you can pass a 641 test without a live loaded packing, but if you have, if you have a, uh, if you have an application where fugitive emission is just not an option, right? Uh, in at whatever level, then, then there are ways to there are ways to enhance that stem seal, such as live loading the packing, uh, particularly in instances where you're going to have thermal cycling, where there will where there will be frequent uh, expansion and relaxation of the components involved. Then, then you know consider those enhancements as a way to uh, you know to further uh, to to further prevent any of these things from happening. Just the uh, belt and suspenders kind of deal, right? Uh, there are also preventive maintenance things. Make sure that you follow, 
uh, your preventive maintenance guidelines. Um, uh, you know, one of the things that gets talked about over and over again, and, and I, I don't see it nearly as often as it should be, is that when a plant comes up to temperature, uh, it's, it's always a good idea to go around and snug up the packing, the gland bolts on, on, on uh, particularly critical areas, right? But, but really on all the valves, right? Because as these things bring up and come up and, and you get some relaxation of, of the bolts and, and that sort of thing that have been laying around on the ground or in a warehouse for, for any number of weeks or months. Uh, so just, just follow some preventive maintenance protocol to, uh, to avoid a potential situation. Uh, and then along those, if you start having problems, uh, utilize some field techniques in order to, to repair the problem, either repack or in extreme cases, drill and tap and basically render that stem seal uh, useless. Okay. So back to the preventive maintenance thing. So, um, so really, it's just as I really talked about, you know, the maintenance really starts before the installation. So proper storage of valves, uh, proper storage of equipment. I mentioned laying in the dirt. That's never advised, right? So uh, try to properly store the valves before you ever install them to make sure that that it's in as close to manufacturer delivered uh, condition as as possible, right? These things are not bulletproof as, as hard as we try to make them that way. Uh, occasionally check your, your, your bolting torques, your packing bolting torques to make sure that the, that the proper load is on it and it has not relaxed over time. Uh, so, uh, and, then, and then I'm just gonna talk really quickly about the, you know, the different types of, different types of valves and where the, where the potentials are, right? So this is a, a traditional unibody floating ball valve. Uh, this, this is the stem seal. This, this is where the, the leakage is going to primarily occur. If it occurs, I'll, I'll just say quarter turn valves in general are, are less likely to have a, a stem seal problem or at least have, a, have a, uh, an FE problem that is approaching the uh, acceptable standard, right? So typically they, they fall well below uh, and, and that is uh, primarily just because of the action of the stem, right? So it's a radial operation. Uh, it doesn't exercise the stem packing nearly as much as a, as a rising stem does. So, uh, but this is, this is the common area. And in this particular valve, the only other seal area is the static seal that basically seals the insert into the, from the body. Uh, this is a static seal. It's not likely to show a leakage rate. In fact, these valves are selected uh, more often than not in the chemical, chemical industry because it has one fewer uh, joint uh, leakage path to atmosphere than the two-piece body, for example. So, uh, so this is a bottomed out compressed gasket here, static seal. And then this insert is, is obviously captured between the pipe flange and the gasket as well. So it is, it is not likely to show uh, leakage, but it is a path, right? It's a potential path. Uh, for 608 style trunnion valves, so uh, 608 as opposed to 6D will have a graphitic based packing chamber, an adjustable packing chamber. Uh, this is an example of one that's outfitted with live loading, right? So this is a, this is a valve that, that, that can be used in hydrocarbon environments. Uh, the, the packing is still adjustable, but you also, and this, this could be used, this may be in a refining, for example, an upgrader that kind of thing that sees temperatures upwards of 400 degrees C plus, uh, you know, these, these Belleville springs can help compensate for the thermal action that's going on between the packing and the stem and that sort of thing. So, uh, and then the body joint, uh, in this particular case, uh, it, is, it is a two piece body, right? So there is a, there is a body joint and an associated gasket it, it, is a, it is a static seal, so not, like, not as likely to be exposed to the dynamics of operation like the stem seal will. And in this particular case, it also has a redundant seal in that there's a, in that there's a, uh, uh, there's a soft seal inboard of the uh, graphite gasket as well. 
So I, th I think if anything, we want to take away from what what we've talked about today and what, what we're going to finish up with and Kevin's going to going to take it kind of from here after this is we, as it relates to the standards, know what you're asking for. I know I've said that several times, but can't reiterate it enough, right? Don't throw the standards around unless you understand what it is that you're asking for. If you need help, call us. We know. Pick a partner with knowledge and expertise, right? Which which leads into what I just talked about. If, if you don't understand, if you need some help, if you just need clarification on what, uh, on what it is that you need to have specified in your vows, call us. Call CGIS, call us. We'll, we'll help you shortcut your way through that to where the, the information that you get in is relevant to what you really want, right? So that I'm going to say thank you all. I'm going to let Kevin pick up these last few slides. I appreciate we had a great turnout. I appreciate y'all's uh, uh, y'all's attention, and and uh, we look forward to being able to answer your questions from after this. Thanks, Doug and Richard. Uh, it's been very informative and uh, uh, well spoken. Uh, great review. Um, Early in the presentation, we talked about the different categories of valves that we've uh, defined for process industry. We had the fit for purpose, general purpose, uh, and severe service valves. And uh, as, as I'm sure we all know, um, and as Doug alluded to, there's numerous valves in, in a facility. Uh, ranging from very benign applications in water, air, to extremely severe applications uh, or lethal applications dealing with hydrogen sulfide or dealing with class M lethal gases uh, if we're in the chemical or petrochemical industries, uh, which have really driven the, the world of valves uh, through the years to provide different designs, uh, different features, uh, to address some of the, the issues that have arisen. And we have an infographic here uh, that is a tool uh, to objectify how, when should we consider a general purpose valve, a fit for purpose valve, or a severe service valve. And really it's, you know, comes down to the, the consequences, the isolation requirements, uh, the process data, acquisition costs or cost of acquisition, uh, purchase price availability, um, and then is it repair or replace? And this, you know, going from the left to the right, as everything increases, it moves us into a different category of valves. And this is something that uh, as a, end users, I know that uh, risk assessments, hazard, hazardous ops uh, review are, are completed, and that information helps us as a as a uh, a partner with you to make recommendations uh, from the the perspective of being a valve manufacturer or a, a valve expert. Um, we're here to be a partner with all of you uh, to assist you from a valve. Uh, perspective because we spend every single day in, in the valve industry and uh, uh, many of us have our, our finger on the pulse of what's developing in the valve industry. Uh, alluded to Doug being part of uh, API and MSS committees. Uh, that's where they're starting to talk about the, the incidents that have occurred and, and what we need to develop as standards. Uh, so we have some extremely uh, involved people uh, that are able to assist with uh, valve selection. And uh, it really comes back to what is the application? What are your expectations? What are your requirements? Uh, what are you trying to achieve? And together, we can work with you to assist in that. Uh, coming out of our MSS task force work is a application severity checklist. Uh, and it'll be, we can then uh, objectively determine what are the scores for these various factors in an application to determine if it's going to be a general purpose valve, fit for purpose, or severe service. Um, and severe service is really also critical service. You know, I've heard many of my clients say, well, that is a silver bullet. 
if we have a failure there, it takes our plant down. Uh, so that has a higher risk level than any other valve in the, in the facility. So this provides a objective review of the, the process or the application and an associated score that gives us a way of objectively, a tool uh, for you to objectively define, is my service severe? Uh, is it really fit for purpose or general purpose? So it, this is something that we really haven't had in the valve industry. For, for many, many years. Uh, we've gone off of uh, specifications and standards that were developed in the 40s, the 50s, the 60s, and the 70s uh, that haven't kept pace with the evolution of process industry, uh, not to mention what we do in industry. We're pursuing uh, applications that are harder than what we have ever experienced. We've gone after all the easiest stuff as as our chairman has said, you know, we've got all the stuff that's on the top. Now we're going deeper uh, or, or, you know, so we're seeing increased in temperatures, we're seeing increases in uh, solids handling, a number of different new uh, conditions that conventional valve technology developed in the 50s and 60s uh, doesn't apply to today. So we need to really think about the valve technology that we're using to have reliable, uh, safe products and service. And that kind of wraps it up. I mean, it, uh, for me, it's, as I said, application dictates the valves and uh, we're here to assist you in, in that pursuit. So we can move on to questions uh, for any of our panelists here and uh, look forward to addressing those. I know that Richard has already been doing that uh, online live. So thanks, Richard. That's uh, been really good. Yeah, it's been great. We could maybe, if, if nobody has any specific questions, we, we could probably pick a couple of the ones that have already been dropped in the chat um, and just kind of talk through those if y'all want to. You bet. Yeah, Richard, good. Were, Richard, were there some that you saw that, I mean, I looked through them too. There, there were some pretty good ones in here, right? So Yeah, uh, there were some really good ones. Um, one came from, let's see, let me see if I can find it. Uh, one came from Scott Brown. He was asking about how much better valves are today than they were as far as meeting FE requirements and, and how exactly did we get there. So Doug, if you scroll down, you you, you've heard my answer before, so you, <laughs> you know what yeah. I'm going to say. Yeah, I think, I think Scott, it's, a, it's, a, it's kind of a, it's a mixed bag, right? So it's hard to, hard to throw a blanket over everybody, right? But I think if, if, you, if you pick your credible partners and, and you are mindful of, of dealing with, with uh, both distributors that, that select their vendors wisely and then, and then manufacturers that, that kind of have a bent towards uh, meeting FE requirements and and trying to stay uh, state of the art. I, I think there's no question that that we have uh, that we've refined our manufacturing skills. Mach machine tools are better than they used to be, um, and I, I think I think we've all learned as manufacturers, uh, you know how to how to manufacture these things so they're much so they're much better able to pass these tests to begin with. Uh, and and provide you know uh, longer lasting, higher longevity products that that uh, you know no, nobody wants to be the focus of a phone call or the focus of an incident report or anything like that. So I I, I think it's safe to say that those of us who care have certainly refined our processes to make sure that the valves we're putting out the door are are able to meet these standards um, routinely. And I think in, a, in a addition to that, um, in the world of valves, as, as designs have improved, we've also uh, improved our coatings uh, in addition to the manufacturing practices uh, where we can use coatings now that have no porosity issues or porosity chain issues uh, that could be present uh, in, in past technology. Um, and in certain applications, that's obviously um, extremely important. There was an interesting one from uh, Dirk about where a non-rising stem gate valve would fall in terms right. of uh, yeah. 
Yeah, so that was an interesting one. Yeah. Yeah, and, and I think one I of the think things your I answer, would... your answer is right on that, right? So it's it's just not it's not an area, and we deal with that somewhat in six forty one too, right? Where where you know there were some NRS valves and some others that that wanted to qualify, but the reality is, is if you're if you're not typically applied in a hydrocarbon based atmosphere or are you know where are even a severe chemical like H two S something like that where there's where there is uh, where fugitive emissions is is likely to be a, an issue then you know there there really is no point in going through a qualification these are not cheap tests either by the way so these are you know there there's there's quite a bit of ex expense involved in in getting going through these type tests and becoming certified so. If I were a valve manufacturer that manufactured a valve that 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 wasn't necessarily applied in these situations, I, I wouldn't bother. Right? It's not it's not like a badge you get to wear around. It's it's uh, it, it's uh, you need to do it for a reason. So I did see um, one of the listeners has their hands raised. Uh, Murad Zerdoni. I can allow you to talk if you if you want to submit your question that way. Uh, you just have to unmute. Don't, don't criticize the speakers. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe uh, go on to the next question for now. Or I don't have to figure that out. Yeah, Richard, so there's one here about cost, right? So uh, <clears throat> I think Gustavo had a question about uh, about the impact in pricing. Um, so obviously, so in API, we're not allowed to talk about cost. Um, it's, it's supposed to be a a strictly a technical discussion, which uh, is always kind of the uh, yeah, always kind of the uh, the elephant in the room, right? But but uh, but but there is a cost associated with it. So I, you know what the what the percentage is. I'm not sure I can I can give that to you because it's it it kind of varies with the application. It varies with with some uh, with with some other considerations. And I, I think Richard has his hand raised to to kind of tack onto that. So, what did you what did you want to say? Oh no, I uh, I was just I think you hit it. It's hard to quantify. It can kind of vary by valve size, type, and all of that stuff. Um, but for sure, the doing this testing is pretty intensive and and costs a chunk of change. But also. Um, you know, just the API 622 packing is more expensive right. than a, you know, plain Jane uh, graphite, you know, packing. I, I will say, Gustavo, in general, that, that this, like everything else in, in the world or in, in you know, uh, in free enterprise system is, is an economy of scale thing, right? So as, as, as these standards become uh, Kind of part of our makeup and and a common thread through everything we do and more widely ex, uh, more widely accepted recognized and required then then there will be uh, these costs will begin to to line up a little bit right there'll be competitors there'll be new new people that can that can manufacture to these standards occasionally and and there'll be more packing choices uh, 622 packing choices so so I mean, like everything, yeah. In the beginning, and in the beginning, the premium was much higher even than it is now. I'll just say that. And so, you know, it it would be normal to expect that that gap would continue to close a little bit over time. Okay. And and for companies like us, you know, the 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 manufacturer of valves to to those standards, you know, is becoming more and more of a of a standard of ours rather than a rather than a special request. Which kind of leads into Lewis Luis's question, right? So is it uh, yeah, I mean obviously Luis, we do have valves that don't comp it just depends on the packing choice, right? And what we put in the, the way it is now. Uh, I will say with 641 though that, that 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 is less of a factor because of the quarter turn uh, situation with 641. So we so we have we have tested uh, just in full disclosure we have tested to 641 valves with with uh, 
with the 622 certified packing and, and passed. And then we've also pulled valves off the shelf that do not have the 622 packing in it. And, and they have also passed, right? So I won't say any, any standard ball valve can do that, but, but we were fortunate that, that ours, because of the machining techniques and that sort of thing that we used, were able to do that. So, so, so the answer is yes, but, but not always. 624 is a little bit different because that is a, that is a, because of the rising stem action, that's, that's a, that's more of a difficult uh, standard to adhere to with just, with just standard non-622 packing in it. Richard, did you have anything to add to that? No, you got it. Uh, okay. Louis had kind of a follow-on question about what percentage of manufacturers in general comply with 624 and 641, which I think is a tough one to answer. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. I don't know the answer to that, Luis. It's it's almost it's an individual, it's an individual thing, right? You've got to look if they qualify. If they comply and they qualify, they have a certificate that states as much, right? So, uh, so the, the the one sure way to find out is to ask them to show them show show him show you their certification, right? That's the that's the one, but I'm not sure. I mean, look, there are there are a zillion valve manufacturers in in the world, and and uh, uh, there are there are very few at the end of the day that, uh, by comparison, on a percentage basis, that really really care whether they really care whether they um, <clears throat> comply with these things or not. And and that goes back to my earlier statement. I think as as these requirements become more of a more of a requirement uh, throughout the industry, right? Where you you guys begin to uh, require these things on a day, then then others are going to have to come into compliance if they want to play. Yeah. And Luis, to address your question about CGIS products complying with 624 and 641, echoing what uh, Doug and and Richard have talked about, um, other products in our product line. Uh, will meet it uh, or comply with 641. Uh, 624 is a little bit different. Uh, it it uh, takes me back to what Dirk was asking about in gate valves. I'd like to clarify that in the world of gate valves, we have a number of different categories uh, and, and 641, or sorry, 624 won't apply to all types of gate valves. Um, you know, we're dealing with knife gates or guided shear gate valves, wedge gate valves, uh, conduit slab, uh, so being specific on the type of gate valve that we're dealing with can then lead us into the conversation around what standards apply. Um, but in, uh, when it comes to rotary and linear valves, if that's a requirement, then CGIS does have products to comply with those. And then Richard, you want to, you want to answer this uh, question about Produ production test versus prototype testing? Yeah, I typed a little bit, um, but I, yeah, I thought it would be good to answer that one. So a type test or a prototype test um, is basically, that's a test that you, that you undertake to qualify a range of product, right? So API 624 and API 641 are type tests in the sense that what the process is, is that you will test that valve um, and it will, by passing that test, qualify a range of valves. So, for example, um, you know, API 624, if I test a, a four inch 300 class gate valve, uh, then what that qualifies is all the gate valves from two to six inch in class 150 and 300. Uh, whereas a production test is a test intended to be performed like on the valve that you're shipping to the customer, right? Um, and so there are two different categories of tests. Prasanti, I saw you're asking, can we test the actual valve and then use it? The, the, so, the, so the type testing like API 641 and like API 624 are rigorous tests that involve lots of cycles. And I would not want to if I were buying a valve from a manufacturer, I would not want to buy a valve that had been tested for 624 or 641. Those are, those are pretty 
pretty wear inducing tests. I would not consider that a new valve at that point. Yeah, there's there's a reason they're set up that way, and that's to that's to really exercise them and simulate as much of, of in process uh, action as possible. So yeah, I, I would I would uh, I would not I would shy away from that for something. An example of a type test um, or a production test. Uh, the the only really good example that we have in the standards that exist now is what Doug talked about, uh, ISO 15848 part two, which is a much more basic test with no thermal cycles um, and, and just a few mechanical cycles to just check that the valve is, uh, you know, is performing as expected before you ship it out the door. So, um, yeah. I was just uh, reviewing some of the uh, chat conversations around uh, diaphragm valves. One, one point I'd like to make about diaphragm valves in general is that while they will fit into an ASME class 150 or class 300 piping system, and 300 is very rare, um, they have a low, they're not ASME pressure rated valves. Uh, and it will vary from one manufacturer to another manufacturer on what their uh, pressure containment uh, would be. Uh, and it can vary anywhere from 60 PSI G to 150 PSI G, but it will vary across manufacturers. So it's a, it's a gotcha, it's a devil in the details uh, that you need to uh, be aware of. So Gustavo's question really, um, so yeah, Gustavo, the, 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 the point, there was a section in the presentation regarding about sniffing. So there is a prescribed method of, of measuring uh, that, that EPA method 21 uh, discusses uh, as it relates to sniffing certain areas and, and uh, whether that's done in, in the environment or in a bagged atmosphere. Richard, Richard, do you have any details you can share with him? But, but yeah, that, that, that's the typical, because, because the Fiji emissions are not typically something that you can see with the naked eye or smell with your naked nose. Uh, sophisticated, uh, sophisticated measuring techniques are kind of required in order to do that. Yeah, so um, at least I'm not familiar with how this works in Canada. Um, I can only tell you to some degree what goes down in the United States. I would imagine because the Canadian regulatory uh, framework does reference EPA method 21 that it's pretty much the same though. Um, and what most refineries, chemical plants, or, or any kind of plant that has a consent decree in the US will typically do is have what they call an LDAR program um, you know, leak detection and repair, and those people will go around periodically with little sniffers, you know, little pieces of electronic equipment, and, and just go and randomly check uh, rotating equipment, pumps and valves primarily, but also, you know, bolted joints, and, uh, and, and just, phys you know, people have to physically go around and check that. There's also uh, kind of a cottage industry of people who do that for the plants, at least in Houston there is, uh, people who kind of, you know, put themselves forward as, as you know, experts who will go and sign up and, and go in and do that on like a contract basis. So it really, um, it, there's not like, a, there's not a, today there doesn't exist a, like an automated regime for detecting fugitive emissions. It's still a bit of a manual thing where somebody's gotta be in the plant with a, with a sniffer, a methane sniffer, and going around and measuring those VOCs. Now, I know that some of the new EPA stuff that's come out has started to um, has started to incorporate methods of uh, VOC emission detection by uh, like camera, infrared cameras, and the new kind of uh, I think the new cutting edge is going to be um, specialized camera equipment that's like mounted on drones that people send out to. But that's that's a little bit more of like a site-wide thing, right? So that helps you a lot in terms of detecting aggregate emissions at a drill site or aggregate emissions from a refinery, but that doesn't necessarily tell you 
exactly which valve is the culprit unless you get your drone real close in there and you can see. Um, but that again, 100 ppm is relatively hard to detect. So it's still pretty much a manual process. Yes. Cool. I think that's a pretty good spot to, to end it if all the questions have been answered. Thanks again for uh, everyone participating. That's been great. We had uh, over 100 people on the line, so that's really good to, to see. And just a reminder, we will send out a, a recording and a PDF of the presentation, so you didn't have to take notes crazily as you were listening to us chat. Do um, you guys have anything else to say, Doug, Richard, Kevin? I mean, I, I just want to thank everybody for taking the time. I know, I know uh, it's, it's hard to get away, even in, even in the virtual world in COVID times, it's hard to, to dedicate an hour, hour and a half of your time. So we, we just appreciate the audience and we appreciate the good questions that, that we received. And, and uh, you know, we, we, hope we, were, we hope we were able to inform a little bit. That's, that's it at the end of the day, right? We're, there's, we know it's an area of, of some confusion typically. And so if we, if we have added some clarity to that, then, then our job is kind of done here. So thank you all. Exactly. I couldn't agree more. Doug, thank you. All right, guys. We'll end it there. Thank Thanks again. Okay. Yep. See ya. See y'all. Bye, guys. <laughs>